War and Peace, Book One, Chapter Twenty Seven, read for LibriVox.org by Kristen McQuillan, MediaTinker.com. At the appointed hour, the prince, powdered and shaven, entered the dining room where his daughter-in-law, Princess Mary, and Mademoiselle Bourienne were already awaiting him, together with his architect, who, by a strange caprice of his employers, was admitted to table. Though the position of that insignificant individual was such as could certainly not have caused him to expect that honor. The prince, who generally kept very strictly to social distinctions, and rarely admitted even important government officials to his table, had unexpectedly selected Michael Ivanovitch, who always went into a corner to blow his nose on his checked handkerchief, to illustrate the theory that all men are equals, and had more than once impressed on his daughter that Michael Ivanovitch was not a whit worse than you or I. At dinner the prince usually spoke to the taciturn Michael Ivanovitch more often than to any one else. In the dining-room, which, like all the rooms in the house, was exceedingly lofty, the members of the household and the footmen, one behind each chair, stood waiting for the prince to enter. The head butler, napkin on arm, was scanning the setting of the table, making signs to the footman, and anxiously glancing from the clock to the door by which the prince was to enter. Prince Andrew was looking at a large gilt frame, new to him, containing the genealogical tree of the prince's Bolkonsky opposite which hung another such frame with a badly painted portrait, evidently by the hand of the artist belonging to the estate, of a ruling prince in a crown, an alleged descendant of Rurik, and the ancestor of the Bolkonskys. Prince Andrew, looking again at that genealogical tree, shook his head, laughing as a man who laughs who looks at a portrait so characteristic of the original as to be amusing. "'How thoroughly like him that is,' he said to Princess Mary, who had come up to him. Princess Mary looked at her brother in surprise. She did not understand what he was laughing at. Everything her father did inspired her with reverence, and was beyond question. "'Everyone has his Achilles' heel,' continued Prince Andrew. Fancy, with his powerful mind, indulging in such nonsense. Princess Mary could not understand the boldness of her brother's criticism, and was about to reply, when the expected footsteps were heard coming from the study. The prince walked in quickly, and jauntily, as was his wont, as if intentionally contrasting the briskness of his manners with the strict formality of his house. At that moment the great clock struck two, and another, with a shrill tone, joined in from the drawing-room. The prince stood still, his lively, glittering eyes from under their thick, bushy eyebrows sternly scanned all present, and rested on the little princess. She felt, as courtiers do when the Tsar enters, the sensation of fear and respect which the old man inspired in all around him. He stroked her hair, then patted her awkwardly on the back of her neck. "'I'm glad, glad to see you,' he said, looking attentively into her eyes, and then quickly went to his place and sat down. "'Sit down, sit down, sit down, Michael Ivanovitch. He indicated a place beside him to his daughter-in-law. A footman moved the chair for her. "'Ho, ho!' said the old man, casting his eyes on her rounded figure. "'You've been in a hurry. That's bad.' He laughed in his usual dry, cold, unpleasant way, with his lips only, and not with his eyes. "'You must walk. Walk as much as possible. As much as possible,' he said. The little princess did not, or did not wish to, hear his words. She was silent and seemed confused. The prince asked about her father, and she began to smile and talk. He asked about mutual acquaintances, and she became still more animated, and chattered away, giving him greetings from various people, and retelling the town gossip. "'Countess Apraxina, poor thing, has lost her husband, and she's cried her eyes out,' she said, growing more and more lively. As she became animated, the prince looked at her more and more sternly, and suddenly, as if he had studied her sufficiently, and had formed a definite idea of her, he turned away, and addressed Michael Ivanovitch. "'Well, Michael Ivanovitch, our Bonaparte will be having a bad time of it. Prince Andrew,' he always spoke thus of his son, "'has been telling me what forces are being collected against him.' while you and I never thought much of him. Michael Ivanovitch did not know at all when you and I had said such things about Bonaparte, but, understanding that he was wanted as a peg on which to hang the prince's favorite topic, he looked inquiringly at the young prince, wondering what would follow. "'He is a great tactician,' said the prince to his son, pointing to the architect. And the conversation, again, turned on the war, on Bonaparte, and the generals and statesmen of the day. 
The old prince seemed convinced that not only all the men of the day were mere babies who did not know the ABC of war or of politics, and that Bonaparte was an insignificant little Frenchie, successful only because there were no longer any Potemkins or Suvorovs left to oppose him. But he was also convinced that there were no political difficulties in Europe, and no real war, but only a sort of puppet show at which the men of the day were playing, pretending to do something real. Prince Andrew gaily bore with his father's ridicule of the new men, and drew him on, and listened to him with evident pleasure. "'The past always seems good,' he said. "'But did not Suvorov himself fall into a trap Moreau set him, and from which he did not know how to escape?' "'Who told you that? Who?' cried the prince. Suvorov, and he jerked his plate away, which Tikhon briskly caught. Suvorov, consider Prince Andrew, two, Frederick and Suvorov. Moreau, Moreau would have been a prisoner if Suvorov had had a free hand, but he had the Hofskrieg Vrschnafsrath on his hands. It would have puzzled the devil himself. When you get there, you'll find out what those Hofskrieg Vrschnafsraths are. Suvorov couldn't manage them, so what chance has Michael Kutsov? No, my dear boy, he continued, you and your generals won't get on against Bonaparte. You'll have to call in the French, so that birds of a feather may fight together. The German, Phelan, has been sent to New York and America to fetch the Frenchman Moreau, he said, alluding to the invitation made that year to Moreau to enter the Russian service. Wonderful! Were the Potemkins, Suvorovs, and Orlovs Germans? No, lad, either you fellows have lost all your wits, or I've outlived mine. May God help you, but we'll see what will happen. Bonaparte has become a great commander among them. Hmm. I don't at all say that all plans are good, said Prince Andrew. I'm only surprised at your opinion of Bonaparte. You may laugh as much as you like, but all the same, Bonaparte is a great general. Michael Ivanovitch, cried the old prince to the architect, who, busy with his roast meat, hoped he had been forgotten. Didn't I tell you Bonaparte was a great tactician? Here, he says the same thing. "'To be sure, Your Excellency,' replied the architect. The prince again laughed his frigid laugh. "'Bonaparte was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He has got splendid soldiers. Besides, he began by attacking Germans, and only idlers have failed to beat the Germans. Since the world began, everybody has beaten the Germans. They beat no one, except one another. He made his reputation fighting them.' and the prince began explaining all the blunders which, according to him, Bonaparte had made in his campaigns, and even in politics. His son made no rejoinder, but it was evident that whatever arguments were presented, he was as little able as his father to change his opinion. He listened, refraining from a reply, and involuntarily wondered how this old man, living alone in the country for so many years, could know and discuss so minutely and accurately all the recent European military and political events. "'You think I'm an old man and don't understand the present state of affairs,' concluded his father. "'But it troubles me. I don't sleep at night. Come now, where has this great commander of yours shown his skills?' he concluded. "'That would take too long to tell,' answered the son. "'Well, then, go to your Bonaparte. Mademoiselle Bourienne, here's another admirer of that powder-monkey emperor of yours,' he exclaimed in excellent French. "'You know, Prince, that I am not a Bonapartist.' Dieu sait quand va vient, hummed the prince out of tune, and with a laugh still more so, he quitted the table. The little princess, during the whole discussion and the rest of the dinner, sat silent, glancing with a frightened look now at her father-in-law and now at Princess Mary. When they left the table, she took her sister-in-law's arm and drew her into another room. "'What a clever man your father is,' she said. "'Perhaps that's why I'm afraid of him.' "'Oh!' He's so kind, answered Princess Mary. End of chapter 27